the ability to be able to coach and pastor and care for people and try to bring people together in community. I think it's just been something that's always been. And when I came to faith in Christ, what happened was I started putting other people's needs before my own. I started doing things right the first time. I started doing things without being asked. I started doing things with a very high level of excellence. I started having a desire to build community. It's pretty easy to get to recognize when you get somebody that really has an authentic faith and loves God because they're there to serve you. You heard me say this in Connecticut, great leaders want something for people, not from people. Hey everyone, welcome to the Walk to Wealth podcast. If you're tuning in on YouTube or any of the podcast directories, make sure to do yourself a favor and give us a follow because you don't want to miss any of the amazing guests I'm bringing on this year. And I don't plan on missing any time soon. So we're going to get right into this one. Ken, for anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to get to know you, to get to meet you, man, tell us your elevator pitch. You know, who are you and what do you do? Man, dude, I love to serve families and love to serve, serve people. And I get to do that in two different ways. Number one, I own a team with EXP. I've got about 45 to 50 agents under me in EXP. Uh, we serve Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida. Love real estate. I don't, I'm not involved. I'm really hands off on the real estate side now. Um, so what I do really is my GSD, uh, which is our, my Gross Stat Drive podcast, As a Leader Grows podcast, my book that I published, um, my Create Conference, which you see behind me. Our next one's in July. Brenda Bouchard, myself, my best friend, Master Jeff, Randy Garn, Gary Brecka, um, Catherine Gordon, Amber Lago, just an unbelievable lineup. We get to do that twice a year. Um, our online community that we do at GSD and one GSD Elite Mastermind, which is God. Man, do some phenomenal, phenomenal human beings and some of the top business leaders and, and uh, business owners in the country. Amazing, Ken. And take us back in the time machine a little bit. What was little Ken yeah. growing up? Were you the typical entrepreneur <laughs> paper route, selling candy bars, yeah. lemonade stand? Or was it something that you kind of picked up along the way? Take us back. Um, a yeah, it's uh, that's a great question. Um, it, the, the number, the one thing that I did do all the way growing up, like I, I lived about half my life in Pontiac, Michigan. Um, the other half of growing up until I graduated high school was in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I was always the kid in the neighborhood that got all the other kids together to play baseball or basketball or football. Whatever we were doing in the neighborhood, I was the guy that got everybody together. And so I didn't really realize that's exactly what I was doing at the time. Um, but man, I was, I was pastoring and coaching people when I was in elementary school. Like I was the guy that went door to or called people on their phone because I mean, back then it was no cell phones. Like, dude, you're so, you're so young. Like we had phones that had cords that were like 49 feet <laughs> long. We'd go from one side <laughs> of the house to the other and your sister's yelling and hollering. Cause like, oh, Ken's been on the phone for five minutes. It's my turn. But I was the guy that put all the, I was the guy that put them all together. I was the guy that orchestrated and organized like all the different things we did inside the community. Um, and I still do that today. So, but as far as leadership wise goes, and as far as understanding what core values are, BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals, mission statements. Um, that was that would have been you know, sometime around 1997, 98. Um, after I had given my life to Christ, I was in youth ministry. I went to this huge event called the Choir of the Fire. Um, Ron Luce, that was Ron's events. He would do events, 10, 15,000, all the way up to 70,000 students and leaders around the country. And I met Ron there, and he's the one that taught me about about how to dream big, how to write vision down, how to create core values, how to live your life according to those core values. And um, in that one leadership session, the first time I learned, God gave me my mission statement for my youth ministry immediately. Um, all of our core values and three years of vision that I wrote down. And out of the three years of vision, everything but one came to pass in three years. That was the beginning of kind of my entrepreneurial journey I had at the time. I don't know, maybe a dozen students coming to my youth ministry. And two years later, we would we had four or 500 coming on a Wednesday night. It was absolutely an amazing, amazing season in my life to learn about entrepreneurship and growth and vision and, and passion and all those things that have gotten me where I'm at today. Yeah, that's amazing. It's crazy how the world works. And usually that person that we are as a kid is usually the person that we're called to be. And as life progresses, we tend to get, have that kid swept under the rug and it takes a while for a lot of people to pick it back yeah. up. So, you know, it, it's amazing to hear how your journey came full circle. And I wanted to ask you because uh, one of the topics I know you talk about a lot and I was first introduced to listening to you back at Guillory's event in December of 2022 when you were in the car on the FaceTime uh, and speaking to us and you talked about your your community 
your circle and your corner. And I knew from a pretty early age that networking, man, that's a gift. And if you can leverage that gift, that you can go like places. So like, how did networking come into play in your life? I mean, I know early on you were gathering people, but like, I mean, think about it. I mean, I networked. I mean, if I wanted to play ball or I wanted to do something in your summertime or you're wanting to get guys together and you want to kiss. Listen, when I, when I grew up, we didn't have all the stuff yeah. in the house. There wasn't, you know, a flat screen TVs, MacBooks, yeah. iPhones, iPads, Nintendos, or PlayStation 18s, or whatever you guys have got now. We didn't have all those things. And we just did. We had Atari with one little toggle switch, yeah. and the football game dudes like all moved at the same time. And Pac Man, like we didn't have those things. So if we were going to do something and and you know get out and play ball and do the things that we did and you know the communities I grew up in Pontiac and in Gainesville, Georgia. I was the guy that put those things together. I'm still the guy that puts them together. You know, at, at yeah. 50 some odd years old, all my guys text me yesterday from Atlanta. All my guys that I that I hoop with, they were texting me yesterday, and we were kind of communicating and talking back and forth yesterday. But I've always the guy that put it together. Um, so I think that leadership component and um, the ability to be able to coach and pastor and care for people and try to bring people together in community, um, I think it's just been something that's always been in it. And let me ask you because. Well, a lot of times entrepreneurship, faith kind of gets swept under the rug because it's like a touchy topic that people don't like to cover. And I love yeah. how bold you are with your faith and uh, me as a follower of Christ myself. Uh, what is that that I feel like every pastor, every person has like a, a Bible verse that they just kind of orients their life around? Like, what is that for you? Like for me, it's Colossians 317. But what is like that your core, if you have one like Bible verse that you kind of live your life around? Oh, mine's going to be Second Corinthians 517. Um, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I was 25 years old when I gave my life to Christ. Dude, I didn't know anything about scripture. I didn't, I couldn't tell you. You said, turn to the book of John. I couldn't tell you where it was at. I was the guy slowly thumbing through my Bible, acting like I knew where it was at. So people in church wouldn't look at me and go, this guy has no idea what he's doing. I had no idea. And uh, which is, which is usually the best uh, because I didn't have all of the stuff from back in the day, you know, all of the, the religious things and then the to-do list and all the things. I, you know, when I when I met Jesus in August of 1993, it was a uh, it was an unbelievable encounter. So if I had one scripture verse, that would be that because that that became real to me in August of 1993. That's amazing. And so, like, how did that play a role into your success, both personally and professionally? Like, how did that play into effect? Because a lot of people they say, "Oh, you don't need to pay attention or whatever, yada yada yada." But it's like, as you said, you it changed your 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 being essentially your core and who you were. So how did that shift into like your professional and your personal growth? How was I able to just prepare? Yeah, but it changed who I was. It changed who I was as a man. Number one. Um, yeah. It made me when my kid, my oldest daughter's 27, she graduates. She just graduated her master's degree last weekend from university of Alabama, Birmingham. And when she was five, I owned my own mortgage company. She'd drop my kids, take them to and pick them up from school every day. We went to private Christian schools, I used to drop, every time I dropped my kids off at school, I'd ask them this question. What are the three characteristics of a servant leader? And my daughter's man from the, I mean, literally Holly was five. She was little. She's five foot nine, five foot 10. My 14 year old is five foot 10, for goodness sake. You know, they look at me and they say, daddy, servant leaders put other people's needs before their own, do things right the first time and do things without being asked. And then every day when I picked them up from school, what they would do, bro, is they would ask me, or I would ask them, tell me how you were a servant leader today. Or they would get in the car and they would already have an example of how they were a servant leader ready for me when I picked them up. And so, you know, when I came to faith in Christ, what happened was I started putting other people's needs before my own. I started doing things right the first time. I started doing things without being asked. I started doing things with a very high level of excellence. I started having a desire to build community. I started having a desire to be relational and not transactional. Even when I was doing, when I started doing mortgages in 2001, I was the top guy in my best friend's mortgage shop. I mean, literally from the, from the get go, the first year I got done, I made like 146 grand. I was his number one LO out of eight or nine guys that worked in the office and ladies, I was number one. Why? Because I've been pastoring for so long and caring for people that it wasn't, Hey, let me sell you a mortgage. Hey, let me finance this. Let me take care of this so I can get a check. It was, how can I serve you and your family? How can I help you and your family? you know, get this home, not have to worry about the mortgage and all the language and the stuff you're not going to understand. Let me serve you and your family and make this process seamless <clears throat> where you're not having to worry about it. And I think, you know, that's probably the number one thing, you know, when you talk about mixing faith in business, 
um, it's pretty easy to get to recognize when you get somebody that really has an authentic faith and loves God because they're there to serve you. You heard me say this in Connecticut, great leaders want something for people, not from people. Bro, you can tell the difference. You get around guys who want something for you and not from you. You can tell the difference when you get in and somebody is like they're having an, an interaction with you and an encounter or a conversation with you. And all the while in the back of their mind, their mind is, their wheels are spinning. How much money can I give them that guy? What can I sell this guy? How can I get him in my program? How can I sell him this? How can I get him to do this? How can I coach him to do this? They're thinking about that. Dude, when I connect and I meet people, the first thing I'm doing is like, okay, who's this guy need to know? Who's this girl need to know? Who do I have? What, who, do, who do I have a relationship with that this individual needs to know to help them become the best version of themselves or help grow or scale whatever business that it is that they're in? And I love that. And so let me play devil's advocate a little bit because I, I agree with you 100%. But for people that grew up inner city, like myself, people that grew up in the projects, people that grew up not having a lot, we're just so hardwired for scarcity, right? We're just so hardwired that people are out to get you and that we see big, you know, business moguls saying, you know, business is war and, you know, you have to fight and kill off and be competitive and be at each other's throats. It's like we hear all these other things. And as I said, I agree with you. It was like there's so many other people out there and other influences that are just telling us the complete opposite of what you're saying right now. It's like how do we start to rewire this mindset of just being growing up in this scarce environment where we have to fend for ourselves and we have to survive and not thrive? How do we begin to even un unpack that? Well, I'll tell you this. I grew up in Pontiac, Michigan. I grew up in I grew up in a very blue collar hood area. I mean, I, I lived I lived in Pontiac. I mean, dude, it's it's not it's not nice. My dad worked in General Motors. All my friends, black. I, one of my best friends' brothers got shot when I was in the eighth grade and got killed. He was 17, 18 years old. That was like in 1984, 1983, 1984. That was when like gang violence first started. It was just now coming onto the scene at the level to where it was getting you know, NWA, they were writing, you know, doing movies about it. You had, you know, all the, some of the rappers, because back in the day when you had, you know, Run DMC and Houdini, Grandmaster Flash, The Furious Five, those, those that's the first concert I ever went to, was Run DMC, Houdini, Grandmaster Flash, and the Fat Boys in Kobo in downtown Detroit in 1985. I was a junior in high school. It was my first concert, first time I ever saw somebody get shot. So, you know, my parents got divorced when I was eight. I moved to Georgia with my mom. I was in second grade from my sixth grade year to my senior year. I moved to my dad six different times, 12 different schools and six different high schools. So I grew up with all the stuff. I'll never forget when I was in the eighth grade, I was living with my dad in Michigan. My mom called me on the phone. She had co-signed. My mom had 11 acres, eight to 11 acres on the lake in Northeast Georgia on Lake Lanier that now would have been worth millions, a couple million bucks, two or three million dollars. Bought it in 1978. And I'll never forget, I was in the eighth grade. She called me and she goes, hey, we're getting foreclosed on. I'm going to lose everything. She had co-signed for another paralegal that worked in her office. She sold her some land and put a double wide trailer on that property. And my mom lost it all. I was in the eighth grade. So you want to talk about scarcity, son? I grew up in it. I, I grew up with a scarcity mindset. I'd never forget. I, we, were sit, we were sitting in Out Burger with Jeff and his family, my best friend, my fiance and his, and his wife were driving down to San Diego. He lives in California an unbelievable home in an unbelievable neighborhood. Kardashians living here, Donald Trump's ex-wife, Al Harrington who played in the NBA forever, two doors down. I mean, we're driving and we stopped at In-N-Out Burger. And I, remember I was sitting there eating this, this In-N-Out Burger protein style with no bun, right? And I'm having this, I'm having this, this protein burger and all of a sudden, I remember when I was a kid how much of a privilege this was. Like we didn't get the, if we went to McDonald's, it was a big deal. Like it was a, like, it was almost like Christmas, dude, when we went to, when we got to go to McDonald's or do something like that. It was, it, it was, a, it was a very different experience. I mean, I grew up in the ninth grade. I worked all summer between my eighth and ninth grade to buy my school clothes. I'll never forget. I had $410 and I went to, we went to Kmart and one other store when I was in the ninth grade to go get school clothes. I paid for my school clothes. Nobody paid for my stuff. We didn't have any money. My mom was on food stamps. So, I mean, I grew up in that same environment. So I'd say number one to anybody that grew up in that same environment I did and you did, don't let that be your excuse. Do not let that be the reason you say, I can't do it. 
absolutely drives me crazy, especially in politics. Politicians play on, when the politicians play, I'm like, dude, do you know where I grew up at? You know, I got beat up in the ninth grade. I, I, in between my eighth and ninth grade year, walking home from Pontiac Northern High School because we had a pool. It cost 50 cents to go, to go, to go swim. I had, I had a couple bucks on me. And there was, about, there was a gang of about six or seven dudes that came up like, give me your money. I'm like, fuck you. The kids are all 17. Oh, go home, eyes black, mouth all busted up. I got my ass beat that day. Went home and told my best friend, had an older brother. We knew who the guys were. You know what he did? He went and found them and beat their ass. Like, you don't, like I grew up in a very rough environment. You, even though you grow up in an environment like that, you don't have to, you don't have to carry that scarcity, that fear, that lack, that poverty mentality, you don't have to carry that stuff with you. And here's how, here's how you get out of that. And dude, it's written right here. For those of you, it's written in my planner right here. I've got a quote right there that says, get in rooms with people who think bigger than you do. You've got to surround yourself. That's where community circle and corner, that's where those things come in. You got to find a community of people who think bigger than you. You've got to find a circle, 10 or 12 people that you hang around with, I said this in the in the, the the business conference, entrepreneur conference I spoke at in Connecticut. Listen, if you don't know the 10 or 12 people, if you don't know their financial situation, if you're not spending, if you're in that 10 or 12, if you're not in the very bottom third, I mean, I'm in the bottom, bottom of my 10 or 12. My 10 or 12 guys are like, they're all billionaire, multi, multi-millionaire, some of them worth over $100 million. Like, and, and, I, and listen, I go in, I add value to their life. When I first went in and started building relationships with some of these guys, I'm like, listen, I want to invest my time, talent, and treasure into you. I'm not asking you for, excuse me, for anything. I want something for you, not from you. What would I say to dudes who grew up like I did and like you did? Say, okay, good. Guess what? Your story is going to sound better when you go, when you break through and you do something. Your story is going to sound better than somebody who didn't have to go through what we went through. We'll tell you this. The one thing Grant Cardone said this to me one time on a, on a on a Zoom. I spoke for Grant three times down at 10X headquarters over the past three years to his entire team. Spoke to all the licensees for Grant a couple of years ago as well. And I'm on a I'm on a Zoom call. It's the the weekly uh, what do you call it mentorship group. Well, fourteen hundred people in this call, and he gave us homework. And this is what he said. He said, "Here's your homework. I want you to find five people to describe you in with one, in one sentence or less." You don't work. So I text Grant and I text Jared and I said, hey, I got a question. Grant goes, he calls me preacher, right? He goes, preacher, what you got? I said, hey, G, this dude named, this new dude named uh, Grant Cardone gave me a homework this week. I was supposed to ask five people to describe me in one sentence or less. Since you and Elena are sitting there together, would you guys be my first two people? And Grant laughed and laughed and laughed and he thought about it for a couple minutes. He said, he said, Ken, you always show up. Every time I look up, I see you on social media. Every time I look up, I see you at my events. Every time I look up, you're hosting your own event. Every time I look up, I see your name. But you know how I do that? Because I grew up the way we grew up. Because here's the deal. Like, we don't quit. Like, there's no quit in me. I don't have quit in me. I'm not the best looking dude. I'm not the sharpest guy. I'm not the smartest guy. I did, I did was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Like, I just wasn't. I'm going to tell you what. Being able to make it through Pontiac Northern neighborhood, being able to make it through a mom who was married three different times. I had two or three different stepdads in and out of my house, abusive, all the stuff, bro. All, six different high schools in four years, 12 different schools in 12 years. If, if, if the first thing that hits you is I grew up in this environment, therefore I've got a scarcity mindset, you're screwed already. So what I grew up in this environment and I made it out of there and I'm alive you know what? There's no, there's nothing, there's nothing can stop me. Absolutely nothing can stop me to do or to accomplish what God's put in my life. Yeah. I love that, man. And I'll make this quick, right? Uh, I have said this one time, another podcast I was hopping on as a guest and I talked about, you know, being silver spoon fed and it's like the material of the spoon doesn't determine the size of the appetite. And it doesn't matter what you're eating with. It, you, if you want to eat, you're going to eat regardless of what you get fed with. Right. And it, I just love your story. And so, where can we connect with you? Where can we find you at? If we wanted to hear more about what it is that you got going on and just follow your journey, man. Yeah, at Ken Jocelyn on Instagram, super easy, K-E-N-J-O-S-L-I-N. Uh, verified, I got about 29,000 followers, something like that. Um, yeah, you can check me out there and there's links to everything on there for what I do. All right, and then the lightning round, make this quick, a sentence or less, uh, five questions, right? Question number one, what is the most impactful lesson you've learned in life? 
Jesus loves me. What is the most admirable trait a person can have? What the? Character and integrity. If you had to change someone's life for one book, which book would you recommend? Be the Bible. What is the legacy that you're trying to leave behind? I want my four daughters to be proud of what their father's done. For anyone that wants to embark on their walk to wealth today, what is the first step you recommend they take? Get in rooms with people who think bigger than you do. Amazing. Ken, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you just hopping on and dropping all the nuggets that you did, man. You're welcome, my friend.